so this this last section i wanted to talk about one more emotional process and that a process that i wanted to talk about is not anger or fear or disgust but is actually about emotions but specifically with the, uh, the feeling of morality um and to be honest i'm not 100% sure that morality can be classified as like an emotional process, although emotions, I think, play a big role in determining our emotional decisions and our emotional um, mindset. And so I wanted to talk about actually how something, remember, because way at the beginning of the slide, um, or not the beginning of these slides, way at the beginning of um, this week, when talking about social neuroscience, I put up this slide about how we're talking about the neural correlates of complex thinking about very personal thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Um, and I think that's something that is very personal and for a lot of people is a huge part of their personal identity is their moral system, is their value system. Um, and in this case, what we're going to talk about is a region that we've referenced a little bit for, which is the orbitofrontal cortex. Um, and the question is, what exactly happens if you damage these regions? Now, there's a lot of interesting aspects about orbitofrontal cortex. One of um, the most con uh, common things that's known about it is that the orbitofrontal cortex is not as active in psychopaths um, as in typical individuals. So these are two um, PET scans where you can just see cortical metabolism. So these are the occipital lobe back here. There's the cerebellum, the brainstem, parietal lobe, frontal lobe. And then you can just see that in psychopaths, the orbital frontal cortex is not as active on average as it is in um, typical individuals. I really should stress this cannot be used as a diagnostic tool. The man actually who made this discovery did it on himself and he was like, oh shucks, apparently according to this measure, I am a psychopath, but by all measures and definitions, he's clearly not. So it's not a one-to-one -one thing. You can tell whether or not someone is a psychopath from this, but it's just sort of a statistical thing. Um, and it actually turns out that damage to this region of the brain, the orbitofrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, what increases what is called utilitarian views in ways that are similar with people who are Machiavellian in their viewpoints, sociopathic, psychopathic, and so on and so forth. Um, because a common trait among psychopaths, sociopaths, and so on and so forth is like, they don't care about feelings, they don't care about emotions, they just care about like, oh, did people get hurt? Were more people saved? Like, what's the problem? It's just, I don't care about the feelings and the emotions, I just care about the end result. So here what I'm showing you are overlay plots of a, six patients who had damage to their orbitofrontal cortex. And the way to read this plot is that look at the uh, the axis down here at the bottom the color coding is showing you the amount of overlap amongst the patients so for example purple on the brain one person really damaged their frontal lobe and it's that whole bit of purple whereas now when you've got the red or the maroon that's where all six people have damage so one person was just the red and the maroon or, or just the maroon i guess and so you can see that when you take a bunch of patients like this yeah there's some variance in which particular parts they're damaging. This purple person damaged also their temporal lobe, whereas you know this uh, maroon person did not. And so what you can just see is, yeah, you've got six people. There is some differences in what they've damaged, but at least the part that they have in common is this orbital frontal cortex. And so what you can do with something very sim simple with these patients is you can just have them read moral scenarios and make judgments about them. So some of these moral scenarios would be classified as actually not being moral at all. So here's a story. Um, you're bringing home a number of plants from a store that's about two miles from your home. The trunk of your car, which you've lined with plastic to catch the mud from the plants, um, will hold most of the plants you've purchased, okay? You could bring all the plants home in one trip, but this would require putting some of the plants in the back seat as well as in the trunk. And by putting some of the plants in the back seat, you'll ruin your fine leather upholstery, potentially, which would cost thousands of dollars to replace. Would you make two trips home in order to avoid ruining the upholstery? This is a decision to make, sure, but it's not a moral decision. Um, here's another situation with involving that's non-morals with brownies. You've decided to make a batch of brownies for yourself and you open your recipe book and find a recipe for brownies. The recipe calls for a cup of chopped walnuts, but you don't like walnuts. However, you do like macadamia nuts. As it happens, you have both kind of nuts available to you. Would you substitute macadamia nuts for the walnuts in order to avoid eating the walnuts? Again, um, not a moral scenario in particular. That's how it's classified. Okay, now there's some moral scenarios that are a little, little bit impersonal. And you'll see what I mean by that in one second. Um, you're visiting a sculpture garden of a wealthy art collector. The garden overlooks a valley containing a set of train tracks. A railway workman is working on the tracks, and an empty runway trolley is heading down the tracks toward the workman. The only way to save the workman's life is to push one of the art collector's prize sculptures down into the valley so that it will roll into the tracks and block the trolley's passage. Doing this, though, will destroy the sculpture. Would you destroy the sculpture to save the workman's life? 
So you have to make a decision about something that, you know, there is some morality to it and it involves doing something to uh, an entity that is not personal. You're not pushing another human onto the tracks to save one human's life. That's obviously the famous trolley problem for those of you who know about it. Um, it's in this case, you're pushing a, an impersonal object. Um, here's another one. You're walking down the street when you come across a wallet lying on the ground. You open the wallet and find that it contains several hundred dollars in cash as well as the owner's driver's license. From the credit card and other items in the wallet, it's very clear that the wallet's owner is wealthy. You, on the other hand, have been hit by hard times recently and you could really use some extra money. You consider sending the wallet back to the owner without the cash, keeping the cash for yourself. Would you keep the money you found in the wallet in order to have more money for yourself? Um, as you can see, the mean emotional rating, it's a, you know, a little bit, still relatively low. The mean emotional rating, for example, on like the macadamia nuts. Oh, no, sorry, that's not the macadamia nuts or the macadamia nuts. On the macadamia nuts, gosh, it's not even there. Gosh, I'm all over the place right now. Uh, forget it. Um, the mean emotional rating is still pretty low. It is a moral scenario, but it's not involving, you know, having to directly interact with this person. It's a little impersonal. You're sending the wallet back. You know he's not going to be harmed. Okay, so it's not as intense. Yeah, there's some morality to it, unlike with the macadamia nuts or the plants but it's a, it's a little bit different, especially in the context of these personal scenarios, okay? These are gonna be a little intense, but this is on, on purpose. You are a waiter, and you overhear that one of your customers say that he's about to go to jail and that in his last 48 hours of freedom, he plans to infect as many people as, he, as possible with HIV. You know him well enough to know that he is telling the truth and that he has access to many potential victims. You happen to know that he has a very strong allergy to poppy seeds. If he eats even one, he will go into convulsions and have to be hospitalized for at least 80, 48 hours. Would you cause this man to have a serious allergy attack in order to prevent him from spreading HIV? Okay, pretty intense thing. The mean emotional rating, as you can see, is a little bit higher than it was in the impersonal scenario. Okay, there's a, there's a, this is a moral quandary. Um, here's another personal one. This one is a very uh, intense moral quandary to say the least. I think I remember hearing once that the author stole this from the old TV show, MASH. I believe this might've happened something in that old TV show from like the 70s, never watched it. You are part of a group of ecologists who live in a remote stretch of the jungle. The entire group, which includes eight children, has been taken hostage by a group of paramilitary terrorists. One of the terrorists takes a liking to you. He informs you that his leader intends to kill you and the rest of the hostages the following morning. However, he is willing to help you and the children escape, but as an act of good faith, he wants you to kill one of your fellow hostages whom he does not like. If you refuse his offer, all of the hostages, including the children and, the, and yourself, will die. If you accept his offer, then the others will die in the morning, but you and the eight children will escape. Would you kill one of your fellow hostages in order to escape from the terrorists and save the lives of eight children? Okay, this is a very difficult type of thing. Mathematically, you could make an argument from a utilitarian perspective that, yeah, killing one person to save many lives is the right thing to do because one life is, um, losing one life in theory is worse than losing, you know, many, many, many more lives. That person who you're going to kill, they're either going to die tonight or they're going to die tomorrow. So a lot of people, especially people who are psychopaths, will be like, I don't know, I don't understand what's the problem. Like that Joe's going to get got tomorrow if we don't do, what, what's the problem? We need to just do this to save as many lives as we can. Um, so what we can do is we can look at how often people say, yes, I would do that. Yes, I would bake the brownies with the macadamia nuts. Yes, I would take two trips. Yes, I would give the man a poppy seed. So that's what's going on here. One means yes, zero means no. And we're going to do it for um, people who have um, damage to their um, orbital frontal cortex or the ventral me uh, medial prefrontal cortex, very similar issue. This BDC stands for brain damage controls and for neurotypical um, normal controls. Why do we need brain damage controls? Because when you're dealing with things like lesions that are you know, big like this, in the same reason that we wanted to have a, a TMS control where we would you know, TMS a different part of the brain than the one we're interested in, we wanna see like, oh, are any possible effects we're gonna see due to damage to this part of the brain of the VMPFC or the, the orbital frontal cortex, or is it about brain damage in general? So when you look at the non-moral scenarios, the three groups are pretty much the same. Yeah, there's a little bit of variance there, but none of it is statistically do, different, okay? They all pretty much will say yes or no at the same rate. Um, similarly, for the impersonal moral scenarios, they actually also will say things pretty similar. However, when you get to these personal scenarios, you can see that the people with damage to their orbital frontal cortex are far more likely to endorse these things um, than the brain damage controls or the neurotypical controls. The 
people with damage to their frontal lobe like this, they're more willing to give the guy the poppy seed. They're more willing to kill one of their um, fellow hostages relative to other people who are, are not willing to make the, those things. And again, an interesting aspect is if, you know, when we then relate this idea about um, orbital frontal cortex and emotions, um, back to what I was saying about brain damage, it's kind of linked because people who are psychopathic have a blunted affect. They don't get as emotional in the same way. They only kind of pretend that they have these emotions. And similarly, it seems as if people who damage this part of their orbital frontal cortex, again, they similarly, they lose some of their emotions. They don't really seem to care about these gut feelings in the same way. And so it leads to a change in their moral disposition. And so this, I think, is a really fascinating, powerful case because so much of our personal identity of who we are how we relate to the world, our sense of self is tied up into something like our moral value system. But it actually turns out that that moral value system can be toggled on and off like a switch as a function of this one particular part of the brain. And so it, it raises a lot of interesting questions about personal identity, how we view ourselves as individuals, and how much of it is actually determined in a large part by our underlying neurobiology. Um, okay, so why don't we, uh, we will stop there. Um, like I said, you're going to read this article about um, empathy and pain and social groups. Um, and then we will discuss that along with these other topics in social and emotional neuroscience when we meet in section. All right.